All right. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Margo. And again, thank you, Nicola, for inviting me to the, the first um, South African Modeling Network conference. Uh, it's a real privilege. And I'm very excited uh, for the future of this um, initiative, and especially with this paper that I'm going to present, which is um, um, part of work I'm doing for National Treasury that I've been contracted to do. And basically, the long term goal is to actually develop a fiscal uh, DSGE model for National Treasury. And in the process of doing this, I'm investigating topics that are of interest, uh, both obviously to Treasury, but also currently. Um, um, of interest uh, to South Africa. Uh, and then the idea is, you know, while I'm doing this, I'm thinking about the best way to model fiscal policy in South Africa um, and also uh, uh, for policy analysis and for forecasting. And, and, and I'll make a point on this again um, towards the end. So the topic today is actually um, um, combining two of the, 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 the papers that I'm busy working on. One is on government debt and interest rate or the effect of government debt and interest rate and on interest rates and the other is on um, fiscal sustainability so i've kind of combined these two together and have for this purposes of this uh, workshop um or this this presentation I've, kind of, I've i've tried to weave in a story a narrative for monetary policy um and you'll you'll hopefully um i think that some of the results are quite interesting and and hopefully the story is is nice and coherent um yeah, so, so I, you know, will obviously talk about the motivation and contribution. I think we will all kind of agree that these, this is an important issue at the moment. And what I really want to do, I'm not going to go into much detail of the model. Um, it, it's, it's, I'm using a model that, that Harry Kemp developed during his um, PhD thesis, which we um, published together as a working paper with through SA Tide. Uh, recently, so I'm I'm busy working with this. It's quite a very it's a very large model. It's 100 equations, um, um, small open economy model. Um, so I'm not going to dive in too much into that. I want to really focus on the the the, the, the policy outcomes, the implications of the of the research that I'm, that I'm showing. And you'll see there's some nice interesting topics, and and I'm sure we'll have time to get to kind of my first attempt at <clears throat> looking at debt debt stabilization. Um, while simulating a COVID-19 type shock. Uh, yeah, and also the optimal policies uh, analysis is also quite interesting. So I really wanna, I'm gonna give you the picture, very broad strokes, and then um, we, will, we, will, we will hopefully have more time to discuss the, the results. And then have maybe have a nice discussion about some of the modeling issues I'm facing and I'm sure others um, are facing as well. So the, the, the the, the motivation for the study is twofold, right? So we, we all know about the, the, the current, you know, global um, um, rise in sovereign debt that, that's happening, you know, all over the world. And this is particularly salient in South Africa, you know, fiscal sustainability uh, um, concerns have been raised for some time in academia, especially by Estian, his, his prominent voice in this, Estian Carlitz, and I see he's actually logged in now, so I'm glad that he, that he manages managed to, to, to log in. Hopefully we get some good comments from him. And this is really, I mean, after the global financial crisis, there's a bunch of papers, but fiscal sustainability has, has been raised much earlier in, in, in the South African literature as well. I think people have seen uh, um, uh, Fouri or, or those Bosov that uh, also looked at counter cyclical fiscal rules for fiscal sustainability. So academia has been concerned for this for some time. But not only that, you know, markets currently are, are, are predicting 11% probability of default within the next five years. Um, and even policymakers, you know, Tito Mbueni came out quite clearly to say that South Africa will face a sovereign debt crisis in the next five years as well. Um, and, and, and again, recently, the, the um, South African Reserve Bank just <clears throat> released their statement and and pointed out that you know the banking sector is, is resilient to shocks, but the biggest risk to financial instability is the sovereign um, debt, uh, a looming sovereign debt crisis. So this is clearly a, an important issue. And the other one, which is a little bit more nuanced, is on the the the, the effect of debt finance fiscal stimulus on interest rates, right? DFFS, I'll refer to. And so essentially, this is. This is, you know, the idea about when government is, is um, um, providing stimulus to the economy, part of that is going to be debt financed. So this can be either expenditures or tax cuts 
that'll be a demand stimulus. But there's this, with the issuance of debt, we know in our standard, you know, ISLMPP framework, that fiscal policy will tend to have this offsetting effect with the higher interest rates um, that will that, that offset demand stimulus. I've put in revenue shortfalls there in brackets because there's also something interesting, I think, that, you know, when we are trying to identify the effect of debt finance fiscal stimulus, that um, it's already quite difficult. And even if you're looking at tax cuts, per se, um, this is also kind of masking or involving revenue shortfalls that actually might occur. And this is also something that Estian has, has recently uh, published on, and I'll mention this again. And uh, why is this interesting to kind of tie it into fiscal sustainability? It's because, you know, the effect of debt on interest rates, on the interest rate is a key transmission mechanism for fiscal multipliers, which, is dom which really dominates the, the fiscal literature. Um, and then therefore, you know, by affecting interest rates, it also obviously has an effect on um, fiscal sustainability. And we know now a lot of, uh, of the discussion, especially in the advanced economies, has been, you know, don't worry too much about debt because interest rates are really, really low. So the cost of servicing that debt going forward, especially if interest rates are projected to be low for very long, um, um, fiscal sustainability is less of a concern. <clears throat> so what is the contribution to the literature? Um, it's, it's, it's pretty well documented that identifying fiscal policy shocks is, is pretty tough. Uh, Ramey's paper, uh, 2019 paper, I think it's the Journal of Economic Literature or, or it's the Journal of Economic Perspectives. I think it's the Journal of Economic Literature. It's an excellent paper. And there, you know, she points out a lot of uh, this kind of the dearth in fiscal policy research that, 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 that were that uh, covered a number of decades, 90, uh, 80s and 90s. And then there was this resurgence in fiscal policy research after the global financial crisis. But again, even in that, um, in that uh, survey of the literature, the, 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 the focus is on fiscal multipliers. Um, so there's not much in, in, in trying to um, um, identify ex uh, explicitly the, the effect of a, uh, a debt finance fiscal stimulus on interest rates. Okay, and their empirical evidence on this effect uh, in the South African literature is also quite limited. Uh, Federica just came out with a, a working paper which looks at um, um, the effect of debt on the spread between US, uh, SA and US uh, long-term government bonds. So that's, probably, that's one of the closest direct papers I found. Um, there's a, there is a very large literature, so if anyone kind of no, um, thinks that I've missed something, please let me know, but I haven't found too much explicitly asking this question. Um, and uh, this is because the literature is mainly focused on development issues, you know, the effect of government debt on growth, um, also more broader question, the effect of interest rates on the macro economy. And then more recently, there's been some work um, by, from the guy, um, from the Saab, you know, Dan Steenkamp, Subaya, um, looking at credit ratings or sovereign risk um, measures as well. So, uh, you know, lots of research, but I, don't, I haven't found anything that's specifically trying to identify the effect of debt finance fiscal stimulus on interest rates in the ESG model. There is a huge literature on, the, on fiscal sustainability. So I'm not citing anything here. Some of them were cited above, but there's not so much. Again, I haven't come across anything yet uh, that's asking the question about optimal policy in this um, context in the, in the DSG model. Um, and I think a big reason for this follows from, from the first point that there's just not been as much um, focus on this specific uh, effect in the transmission mechanism. So, <clears throat> you know, I motivate in this paper that, you know, a, a, this is a mouthful, but I think those who are familiar with DSG, when I say these key words, you will, you will automatically have a reference point in mind. So this new Keynesian open economy fiscal DSGE, mixed stochastic general equilibrium model, um, is well suited to answer these questions. Um, so, as I mentioned, this is based on a recent working paper, um, SA Tide working paper from by Kemp and, and myself. Um, oh, I forgot to mention that the usual disclaimer applies. I've never had to say that before, and I just realized that I might have, I think I should have said that, that uh, my views are my views entirely and not that of national treasuries. So, this DSGE model, um, the main thing is that it, it, it includes a non-trivial role for fiscal policy. There are six instruments. You know, a fiscal um, government uh, can consume, they can invest, there's transfers between two types of households. So there is household heterogeneity, um, Ricardian and non-Ricardian, or households that can access financial markets and households that, you know, are hand-to-mouth, they just 
eat what the wage income is. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then there's a personal income tax, that's leg in income tax. There's um, corporate income tax, which is uh, 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 with property tax, which represents capital tax in the model. And then there's consumption tax, which is the equivalent to VAT. We also use all the observable data for, uh, uh, um, uh, from the treasury for all these variables as well. We include sticky prices and wages in all the various domestic, foreign import, export markets. Um, this um, um, allows for a role for monetary policy in the new KNC setup. Uh, obviously, again, why uh, this is an, a good model well suited, suited for these questions, because it's important to control for you know, households that are potentially rational and forward looking and optimizing. And, and, and most notably that, you know, the optimal decisions don't change over time based on policy decisions. So that's key. And this is obviously, we all know the criticisms with rational forward looking um, 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 agents, but this is a very useful starting point and there's plenty of um, ways to, to, to kind of extend this to, to you know, rational inattention, um, um, anticipation, um, anticipated shocks or Etc. You, you can you can introduce rigidities later on. Um, so we estimate this with South African data. I don't include the recent COVID-19 um, data for obvious reasons. I think that's an a challenge entirely of itself. So I estimate the data <clears throat> up to the end of 2018 when I was working with it, and then when I do my counterfactual simulations, I do input the most recent data for the variables that I include, and then um, we I try to, to to kind of model the COVID-19. Um, um, scenario. So I just wanted to point that out in case I forget. Um, so, and there are 18 observable variables in this model with 18 shocks. Um, so again, it's a very large model. It takes quite long to, to run. And, and I definitely think if the treasury is going to use such a, uh, such a big model. It's, they should link it up with a high performance computer to, to make it run much faster. So let me just give you a quick overrun of the main um, findings. Just want to check my time. Um, so that we all kind of on board with with my conclusions and then we can dig in a little bit further. So firstly on the effect of uh, debt finance fiscal stimulus. What I've shown in the paper not not in here and and you know I'm still working on on the econometrics there, but uh, you know I'm, I'm happy with kind of where it's what it's showing at the moment, but um, if anyone does look at the paper later on I'll, I'll, I'll welcome some comments there, but essentially what I try to show is that well, what I do show is that reduced form estimates, they provide very quantitatively very similar results to the net effect of debt finance fiscal stimulus on real yields um, in the DSG model. I'm emphasizing real yields because a lot of the literature looks at real yields um, and, and because this is directly related to fiscal sustainability measures, right? Most of us know that, you know, if, if, the, if the growth rate of the economy is greater than the real rate of return on debt, then fiscal policy can can run um, uh, uh, deficits in perpetuity. Uh, or if the real rate is greater than the growth rate, then they'll need to run <coughs> primary surpluses. So we find very qualitatively similar, similar results. But for fiscal policy analysis, there are very clear non-negligible differences in the responses of households, firms, and the mon monetary authority, as well as the risk premium, to each of the ag aggregated fiscal policy shocks. So if we, yes, we, we want to just estimate the, the, the effect of debt on real yields. Well, you know, some reduced form ad hoc specifications, that it's fine. It seems to produce qualitatively similar, similar results. But if we want to do policy analysis, we need to dig a bit deeper and look at the disaggregated instruments of fiscal policy. And this is notably um, uh, more clearer for expenditures. Um, so, for example, you know, an, an investment-driven DFFS, as opposed to a government consumption-driven one, would produce far more favorable fiscal sustainability outcomes. Right? So, it's important to think. And then, I mean, even someone asked a, a nice question the other day. I had to present this uh, a different, slightly different version of this to Treasury earlier in the week. And you know, the great question was, "What do you mean by investment-driven DFFS?" And we can maybe talk about that later because it's not obvious what I even mean there. And, and some of the, the presentations from yesterday, which really dived into microeconomic data um, and trying to map that to macro policy was, is really where I think we need to, to think much more carefully. Um, and the, the next finding, the fourth finding is that fiscal revenue shortfalls okay, are unambiguously contractionary. I'm referring to them as revenue shortfalls because I think 
you know, there's, I'm not, I think this is a better description of what's happening when there are tax cuts. And I don't think these are tax cuts. I think these are revenue shortfalls and these are unambiguous, unambiguously contractual. So, you know, the theory would say a tax cut that is debt finance should still be demand stimulatory. But um, when we model these, these are unambiguously contractual. Um, and so this is a nice uh, pay, uh, um, discussion that Estian brings up. And if you look at the footnote, we're really emphasizing the, 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 that fiscal policy must ensure a stable and predictable stream of tax revenue over the business cycle. And this really you know, look, uh, uh, focuses on the accuracy and credibility of the official projections. And we've seen a lot of this recently, especially when there's a lot of uncertainty, that uh, revenue far, uh, is far undershooting the, the forecasts. Right, and so then you need to find the debt for this, and this is a really crucial um, issue. And it's also why I mainly focus on government uh, investment and consumption as the instruments of policy. I don't foresee, you know, that it's wise to start, you know, using um, um, uh, taxes as as a kind of, uh, you, you know, uh, as an instrument for fiscal policy because you also want to ensure that a smooth and stable. Um, um, income stream for households and firms, and you don't want to disrupt that too much. Um, we, I find here, yeah, this is bringing in some of the monetary policy results that these shocks contribute about 10 to 13% of the variance of fiscal sustainability measures. I want to flag maybe some issues about identifying monetary policy here later on. And we also see that the effect of risk of the risk premium in the long-term rate also contributes approximately the same um, um, degree of, of, of variance to our two measures of fiscal sustainability. For optimal policy, okay, for fiscal sustainability, it's, it, you know, I've run very, very, quite a few number of different um, scenarios. I'm only showing one specific one here. But what I see is that government expenditure need not be counter-cyclical. That is, it need not counter-cyclically respond to um, um, output deviations, right? But it must be subordinate to fiscal sustainability. So the wherever the debt levels, if the debt level, you know, if 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 debt is rising very rapidly, the 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 strength of the response of government expenditure should should take into account that debt level over and above where the level of GDP is. Um, and there's also because you know there's a lot, there's, it's very difficult, um, and 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 there's a, there's often a, a lot of uncertainty about whether or not government expenditure is crowding in or crowding out. And if it even is that doing crowding in or crowding out, is often very marginal, and especially for um, consumption and transfers, um, they, the, the multipliers will be quite far below one, and sometimes even negative. And there's a separate paper that, um, well, in that, in that Kemp and Hollander paper, um, that's all about fiscal multipliers in South Africa. You can go and reference that if you like. Then, you know, a little bit of juiciness for Nicola, <laughs> you know, bringing in suboptimal monetary policy. And what I find here is when I'm thinking about optimal policy, that the monetary policy in South Africa is, is suboptimal only to the extent that the South African Reserve Bank has a preference for interest rate smoothing. So in other words, you know, we know that the central bank likes stability. They like to you know, transition to different re maybe regimes or even to different paths. You know, it took a long time to, to, to move to the midpoint of the target band. So there, there's a lot of interest rate smoothing that goes on. And it's not obvious that, that it's desirable to have an interest rate that, that fluctuates a lot. We can get into that. I'm of the opinion that it's not necessarily that um, crucial, but um, it's definitely a safe path. So you will see that I don't think actually monetary policy is, is suboptimal. It's actually doing what it does best at the moment. And what's really interesting is that if we look at an independent optimal fiscal policy and an optimal monetary policy, that this it turns out that this coincides quite closely with optimal policy coordination. So that means that if the, you know, the, the monetary authorities need, can maintain their independence, they need not change their mandate, they, um, and if they focus on inflation and output stability, the, 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 kind of, the reaction function of monetary policy that, that we estimate um, it doesn't change much. Uh, if, if we had to combine the, 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 the targets of fiscal and monetary policy as one. Okay. Um, and then finally, you know, I find that there's, there's, there is this, what appears to be a, a trade-off between 
I don't want to say clear, but it, it, lo it looks pretty clear that there's a trade-off between long-run debt stabilization, which is kind of like a hard approach to fiscal sustainability, and short-term fiscal sustainability um, being the, the, the softer version. And, and when I'm talking about fiscal sustainability there, I'm talking specifically about the fiscal sustainability gap, um, a, a short-run version. So there's this trade-off between long-run and short-run um, short um, debt stabilization. How am I doing? Okay. Um, as I mentioned before, um, you know, this is just plotting, uh, just to give a little bit of an illustration, there's a, you know, and the literature also highlights this, uh, uh, you know, uh, quite well that, you know, the, the level of government debt to GDP has a very, very strong close, uh, uh, relationship with the term spread. This might not look strong here, but I think, you know, debt is, is, is a little bit more, more robust than the government budget, but, um, the, the main point here that there is this relationship and um, um, that, that with rising government debt to GDP, the term spread widens. And in, and in the right-hand panel, you know, that's the budget balance. So obviously it'll be more downward sloping. And this um, measure estimates the average effect of changes in debt or deficits, the proxy for debt finance fiscal stimulus. But theoretically, DFFS programs um, directly stimulate aggregate demand through government expenditure or tax cuts. Okay, but their effectiveness is highly dependent on a number of things. And I highlight three that are directly related from the literature, obviously, but directly related to um, um, the modeling environment. So firstly, you know, it can directly crowd out private sector expenditure. There are spillover effects to the private sector through higher interest rates, in particular through the risk premium. And you can think about that graph relationship I just showed you. Um, as well, it's also highly dependent on the interaction between po fiscal policy and monetary policy. And this is, tends to be more indirect, right? So if there's crowding out, if there's um, um, a, you know, disinflation, the monetary pol policy authorities will respond accordingly to that. And that can either um, um, uh, uh, exacerbate or mitigate the, the initial fiscal policy response. So these are this, the kind of the key theoretical transmission mechanisms that, that, that you can keep in mind when, we, when I talk about the results. And I, I kind of, as a first blush, um, you know, the literature is fairly new to me. I've uh, one, two years been looking at fiscal policy and um, uh, like more, more closely. Um, so I kind of, you know, looking at the, these two measures, the left panel, government debt to GDP, that's kind of my long, long run fiscal sustainability measure in the sense that, you know, in these models, we look at the deviation from, from a steady state. Um, and this is, you know, a strict, quite a, quite a, quite a strict assumption. That, that dotted line is actually, it's shifted down. I, sh I, I forgot to change this. It should be at about 41%. But essentially what you can think about here is when we're looking, thinking about government debt stabilization that, you know, the policy instruments will be used to minimize those deviations around that long run mean. On the right hand side, I look at a fiscal sustainability gap. I'm not so much interested in the long run. So on the right hand side of the, of the, 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 the slides there, you'll see the, the, the primary balance sustainability star. Um, and that's as a ratio of GDP. This is the typical kind of long run um, um, fiscal sustainability gap measure or how it's derived. And you have a long run real interest rate, uh, a long run growth rate, G, G star, and then an initial level of debt. So I kind of adapt this slightly. I want to look at the contemporaneous fiscal sustainability gap. That means that at each given point in time, um, what primary balance would be required to be ensure that debt does not accumulate? Right, so we can also think about like that, that deviations from, from the mean there being um, if you get long cumulative deviations, there you're building up um, either, you know, sound uh, fiscal sustainability. That's, you see there between 2000 and 2005, this large increase, that's when debt was coming down. You can see it on the left-hand panel. Um, and then more recently, you said with, see with the accumulation of debt that the fiscal sustainability gap tends to be below. But of course, we are including here the real interest rate, um, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the real interest rate on, on government debt servicing costs, which includes the risk premium as well. Uh, and so this, this actually can mitigate, and, and, and we'll look at this a little bit closely, and you'll see that you know, the, the, the positive deviations are much larger than the negative. And this is actually suggestive, what I get from our results at least, that there's not much attenuation of debt accumulation towards the end of the sample because the model is saying, well, we're not that far off from, from a 
from a sustainable path. Obviously, the model doesn't know about the future environment. So we can think about how to, to best um, model that. What am I doing here? Okay, I'm, I'm going to target, you know, another, maybe 10 to you, so 20 minutes. Nicola, you can interrupt me if I'm, if I'm waffling too much. Um, so here's the uh, impulse, some impulse responses to uh, government expenditure shocks. So what you see here is, you know, uh, the green line is government consumption spending. The, the red line is government investment spending. And the blue line is government transfer, um, a transfer shock in the bottom panels. And then I combine the effects on the right-hand side. What you can basically see here is that, you know, an, an, an increase in government spending, right, leads to debt accumulation. That's the top, far top left um, um, panel. So this is in sense when we're thinking about um, uh, uh, demand, fiscal policy demand uh, um, stimulus, right? There's a component that's being debt financed. So we're looking at the effect of that debt increase and how that might increase short-term interest rates. But here we can also kind of tease out the, the transmission mechanisms and also I want to highlight this, this kind of non-negligible responses between the different types of shocks. So you see here for um, consumption spending and transfers, they're actually um, kind of either disinflationary in government spending shocks or reduce output even and inflation for transfer shocks. So there's this crowding out effect. And because of this crowding out effect, output and inflation falling, the short-term interest rate actually falls. This is the, basically the monetary policy response. Um, um, and then this leads to... Um, well, this dampens that, that initial negative crowding out. And then also we see the much higher debt to GDP ratio increase. On the other hand, we see the clear advantages, possible advantages of investment. So an increased investment has a strong output and step, um, output response as well as inflation. This actually leads to holding all, everything else constant, obviously. This leads to an to a increase in the short-term rate, right? It's the response of monetary policy to this increase in aggregate demand. Um, and this then, um, in fact, dampens the investment response. You see that de the accumulation of debt is much less. And so the actual debt to GDP ratio, that's in the third row and, th and second, I mean, second row, third column, um, is actually negative for about six quarters and then mildly positive thereafter. And this actually dampens um, significantly the increase in the long-term rate, right? Because it's that short-term rate that's actually adjusting predominantly um, uh, in response to the fiscal policy. I don't want to go into this table too much. I mean, the slides will be available. You can go back and look at it. Essentially, this, this is just focusing on the, on the sensitivity of interest rates to government debt. And here you can just see the, the clear difference in government investment response to the other shocks. But if you look at the, at the final two rows at the bottom, you see the maximum responses to on the real yield the real 10-year yield and the risk premium are very similar across all three, right? So this is why it's so important that, yeah, it might be that the outcome at the end has a similar uh, effect, but the dynamic response of the economy is very different. And so if you think about cumulative investment spending or transfer shocks, you can actually lead to very different um, 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 paths for the economy. I'm not going to go into the tax stuff so much. The reason is, or reasons I've given above, but what's quite interesting here is that I found that um, um, all the different types of tax shocks, you know, the consumption or VAT, corporate income tax, PIT, all have very similar qualitative results, right? The varying degrees of magnitude, but very similar um, responses. So I'm not going to get into that too much, um, but you also see a very similar story across the, the, the uh, sensitivity um, results there. So I just want to show um, this slide of, um, um, to kind of highlight role monetary policy plays in fiscal sustainability. So this um, black line is that fiscal sustainability gap I showed earlier on. And bars going up are the contribution of monetary policy shocks all right, to the fiscal sustainability gap. So where positive is actually a good thing, right? So there, the primary balance, where it can be a surplus or a deficit, but the primary balance is greater than the primary balance that would ensure a stable level of debt at that period point in time. Um, 
So the, the response, the contribution, as I said, was about 10% and as well as for risk premium shocks and risk premium shocks are actually embedded in the light blue bars for demand. It's with uh, preference shocks and investment shocks. They netted off of it. Um, um, but what I want to point out here is that, you know, it's not clear to me that this is an accurate identification of monetary policy. So what I even did here for this specific result is I included correlated um, um, foreign monetary policy shocks, right? Because foreign monetary policy typically operates through the uncovered interest rate parity condition, okay? And, and then there's international risk sharing and consumption, depending on how tightly you 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 restrict that relationship, okay? Um, but yeah, so you know, I'm always uncomfortable with thinking about you know we take this this the the the, the, the interest rate as it is, um, and then we just model this reaction function and then any kind of, you know, excess deviations of monetary policy are just domestic. So I include this foreign component and even when I do that, that's the red bar. You only see the small red bar there contribution that's really just increasing a, 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 or at least assisting the domestic policy shocks very, very, very little. We even include um, a time bearing inflation target that, you know, starts, it's an HP filter that starts initially at the sample and then it converges to the midpoint, four and a half percent by about, I think it's 2004, somewhere in 2004. So even including a time bearing um, <coughs> inflation target still doesn't, you know, seem to, to, to kind of change the results too much. So, so that's just what, it is interesting. It might be, it's a, maybe a robust model result, but I'm still, uncertain about you know how much we can attribute to monetary policy in this setting but anyway it's about 10 percent, and it seems that monetary policy you know as, as far as interest rates are very low it seems to allow kind of you know what obviously it, it, it um, um it softens the fiscal sustainability burden of of the of the, of um, the national treasury of south africa um it's kind of a similar story here for the debt level okay so let's just skip that Moving on to optimal policy. Um, so I kind of, you know, then it, it's one of the other applications. I think very simple. I'm not talk, thinking about, um, you know, uh, um, uh, utility function here, you know, a, a social planner, um, welfare uh, function. Here it's just a, a, a loss function. In other words, you know, the success of policy is measured by the stability of, of the authorities to, to minimize the instability in, in their target variables. So for monetary policy, right, this is, you know, we know this is output and inflation. So they will, might have this, this loss function of output, which is Y and or its variance. And then there might be a number of other variables in this uh, vector X set, right? With, with specific weights we can put on it. So you might, you know, you care about output, you care about inflation and also as I mentioned earlier, monetary authorities would also care about the, the instrument instability, clearly, okay? When you estimate a reaction function of monetary policy in most DSG models, the coefficient on, on, the, on the persistence of interest rate is very, very high. And I might actually mention this again, that it's quite, it, it, it's, it, it's a bit misleading when we think about the reaction of monetary policy to um, inflation and output. When there's a lot of persistence in the interest rate, it's not necessarily this one and a half response that we, we normally hear. It's one and a half multiplied by, you know, the, the, the one minus the persistence of, of, of monetary policy. Anyway, um, and then for fiscal policy, you know, we, I've, I've shown you, we're going to look at output and debt, right, as this hard measure. And then um, we all, as the kind of the soft measure, these are the two extremes, we're going to look at this fiscal sustainability gap, which is a percentage of GDP. Right, so when we look at just the def deviation of output from its long run trend and the deviation of debt from its long run trend, um, this is a kind of a much harder uh, approach. I'm actually not gonna show the results here for that one specifically. I'm gonna focus on the sustainability gap because it, it's, more, um, it's, it's more unlikely that uh, the, the hard option would be the way to go. And again, if we can talk about it later if you, if you want to dig into it. I can pull up the results if necessary. So uh, what's happening here is that the, uh, the, 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 the fiscal policy and monetary policy will control their instruments, right? The interest rate from the monetary authorities and you know, government consumption or investment spending. And they will adjust that in to try to minimize the instability in these target variables. 
Okay, the fiscal reaction function, I've kind of described them a little bit, um, but they're quite standard. The government follows simple feedback rules, and there, you know, you're responding to output and, and debt, that's Y and B. Um, and then for the monetary policy authorities, we have a, a standard tailored type reaction function. And this is what I mean about the persistence. When phi R is very large, about 0.85, even sometimes 0.9, you know, you're multiplying your coefficients by 0.2 or 0.1, which, which substantially reduces them. Now, we estimate very standard coefficients here that keep coming up in the literature. It's one and a half for pi, you know, about 0.5 or 0.35 for uh, output deviations or growth rate. Um, uh, yeah, and that's a whole nother identification issue on its own. So the policymakers are going to choose these phi, these thetas, that's these ones, and the phi's there um, to minimize that loss function. Uh, so in this one, I'm just again showing the 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 fiscal sustainability gap as a, as a ratio of GDP. And here the weights are equal on output and fiscal sustainability. And then I vary the weights on the two instruments. So we look at the highlighted yellow column here. There's, you know, the, the fiscal authorities really are not, uh, they don't care about how much they need to adjust government spending and investment to hit their two targets. What's interesting here is that the coefficients, the optimal value of those coefficients, those thetas, um, are very close to what's estimated in the model, all right? Uh, but we see that uh, uh, government expenditure should, uh, re, you know, adjust or can be basically acyclical, right? And I mentioned this earlier that it need not actually be counted cyclical. We get even more stronger results if we look at the debt level. This will be negative in the sense that government expenditure can be actually pro-cyclical. Um, and this is partly due to the crowding out effect, but you even find it for investment expenditure. It should be pro-cyclical, but it's just very strongly to government debts. So that coefficient can come up to about two, two and a half. Okay. But in this setting, the soft version of fiscal sustainability, you know, we see that government expenditure could have been um, more stronger in its, de in its adjustments, twice as strong as what's estimated and, you know, being less um, active, uh, uh, um, um, less counter-cyclical in a sense. If we just run this, this, um, this simulation, just with looking at investment, right, we see that the estimated coefficient uh, of adjustment on output is very, still very similar to that of the estimated uh, model on the historical data, right? But then we see again about a twice as large increase that needs to, you know, adjust to debt. So again, that's why I mentioned that that, that the fiscal policy, and if we think about optimal fiscal policy in, in, in a sustainability environment, much more focused on the debt environment. This makes sense, of course, but it's nice to confirm this. That, you know, you, you, you not, well, I mean, if we, fears about fiscal austerity, for example, might actually fit this, uh, be the, be, this result might actually counter that kind of concern about fiscal austerity. Yeah, at least for the soft example. So what about monetary policy? So if I'm looking at um, um, the weights on the kind of your traditional um, monetary policy variables of output and inflation, right? Giving them a weight of one again, and then we also vary the weights on the policy instrument, okay? What's very interesting here, regardless of the weight on the instrument, and this is why I mentioned the persistence of the policy rule. See, I'm not changing the persistence of the policy rate here, I'm only changing the weight on its instability. And the monetary authorities are only changing their reaction to inflation and output growth. It might be interesting to look at um, um, the, the persistence parameter, um, if, if you guys think so. But what, what I found very interesting is the coefficients are very stable across all of these. And there's the estimated coefficients, and you can see it's as large, um, or more than twice as large, the response to inflation, and, uh, and uh, you know more than twice as large for response for output. But again, as you saw in the reaction function, and I just point out that the size of that coefficient is multiplied by that one minus phi r, and phi r is about 0 0.85 in this model. <clears throat> um, okay, but now what if we, um, what if we uh, look at, you know, this is very contentious, but let's say monetary authorities care about output and the primary balance sustain or the sustainability gap of fiscal policy with equal weight. And then we vary the weight on inflation. So, you know, we say, okay, but they also still care about inflation and then down to zero. And again, you see this stability in the coefficients, right? That are optimal. 
And I think a main reason for this is that, you know, by definition, the primary balance um, deviations are almost demand destabilizing or, or, or stabilizing. So if the monetary authorities care about output and the primary balance, which is also affecting inflation, and they, 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 they reduce, uh, reducing the instability there, um, and the monetary authorities can't actually minimize um, um, supply side shocks, right? So cost push shocks, for example, that's, that, that move output and inflation in opposite directions is much more difficult. They can't, monetary policy in the new Keynesian model can't close that gap, all right? So it seems that this, these two coincide. So what about if we look at policy coordination? So now we combine output, the primary balance, the sustainability gap, and inflation with equal weighting, and we again vary the weights uh, on, on, on the instruments, which is now just investment, government investment, and the interest rate. And you, you see very similar coefficients for what we had for the individual policy responses, right? This bottom uh, yellow highlighted column, right? Three, one, about, it's three, one. And if you look at the fiscal policy one, this bottom one here, 0.19 and 0.1, or you get 0.19 and one. So even when policy is coincides, that the estimated coefficients are the same. Um, and again, um, uh, well, the, the, yeah, the, the, the optimal values are the same, sorry. Here again is the estimated values for your ref reference. Okay, and what happens again if, let's just for instance sakes, we just looked at the role of fiscal policy, just to highlight that kind of need not be counter cyclical story um, that you see here that, that investment expenditure can actually respond um, pro-cyclically to output. That it's negative because it's negative in the, in the, in the um, reaction function there. So negative times the negative is positive. Um, and then a much stronger debt response. So, yeah. so let's plot some of these counterfactual simulations, right? So we can estimate the bottle and get shocks, get, uh, take the, 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 the estimated shocks and then fix all the parameters to, those, to their estimated values, and then run, a, run those shocks as observed variables through the model, and then change these parameters on the fiscal policy instrument to get alternative paths. So here we have a blue line, which is the actual path. The, just note that the, on the, for the initial part of the sample, they, they may, it may not coincide directly with actual data because there are some initial values um, that, that need to be Kind of adjusted for but they're the same across all simulations so that's why they're the same in the beginning there um so the blue line is the actual um uh, path of jet debt to gdp the red dotted line is the optimal simple rule for the hard uh, uh fiscal uh, uh kind of um, debt stabilization objective the, the the yellow stars are our fiscal sustainability gap the soft version and then we have the diamond which is the co coordinated policy and so you can see here very clearly that the hard version kind of pulls the, the jet debt to GDP ratio much closer to the mean. So there's obviously, there's a much clearer um, um, uh, or much uh, um, more pronounced kind of stabilization path here. But again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you, I think this is possibly, um, there's a bit of a trade-off here. And then you see, if you look at the, the other two measures, that particularly at the end of the sample, <clears throat> there's only a, some marginal improvement on fiscal sustainability if we're just looking at fiscal policies role. And when we're looking at coordinated policy, there's not much here. But we definitely see, you know, that um, um, the reduction that debt that took place actually leading up to the financial crisis need not have been so large. Okay? And that's, an, I suppose, in and of itself, it's, it's interesting. But again, the model, what you're telling the model is you're saying, hey, I want you to squish me to, that, to a straight line that's around uh, 40%. And let me just skip. And you can actually see this if I'm just looking at the debt level. So this is the equivalent of the graph I just showed you, but now just looking at the level of debt deviating from trend. And you can see the orange line here, which is the hard version kind of on um, um, the zero line there. But you still see, and you can see the pronounced role of the fiscal sustainability gap here, that it is actually kind of reducing the burden on, 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 on fiscal policy in this sense. Um, here's the kind of equivalent graph for fiscal sustainability, right? Um, so you can see very clearly again that the, the model kind of thinks or is reading that, you know, debt, debt need not have been so high during this period. 
and in the in the mid 2000s and then towards the global financial crisis and only some kind of attenuation of the debt increase towards the end of the sample and then you see this large variation in the fiscal sustainability gap that comes from the hard measure um, i'm not going to look at the output response i just want to point out the the effect you know what monetary policy coordination might have on inflation and you see here the purple line i wonder if i can zoom in there we go for you guys the purple line here is this coordinated policy and you basically see just a much that 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 stronger reaction right that we saw in the coefficient estimates of 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 uh, monetary policy and it's typically on the upside right um it's, it's slightly lower during the 2000s which is interesting but um um, it's responding much stronger to, to, to kind of the peaks of the boom phases when inflation might, is rising. And then you can see the effect here, right? So the purple line inflation, you know, is about you know, a couple of percentage points if annualized terms a little bit lower um, in the model. And, it, and it's obviously it's trying to bring the, the level down to four and a half percent annualized. Um, yeah, so there's the marginal role for fiscal uh, monetary policy here. And, uh, and I think a key reason here why is one, the, well, two reasons. One is that persistence, okay? And the other um, um, being that most likely that there are supply shocks that are occurring here, that monetary policy just, you know, it, 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 there's no, when they're caring about output and inflation, um, you can't stabilize both if there's supply side shocks. Um, so this could be like basically the, the maximum of uh, kind of, um, achievable stabilization that monetary policy could have done. So this is why I think that you yeah, are suboptimal, but only to the extent that the, 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 the monetary authorities kind of care about interest rate persistence um, and not so much about instability of the policy rate, it seems. Okay, so the last set of results. Nicola, am I good to go through this? Is it, is it uh, are we fine to continue? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. Okay. I hope I'm, I'm not yeah, saying too much. Um, all okay, right. So what I did here is I looked at a kind of, a, this is the first stab at trying to simulate, you know, a COVID-19 scenario. So we have our two sustainability measures here. And what we do is we estimate the model up until the end of the sample. And then we, we forecast, um, uh, we can have an unconditional forecast, which is the dash line. So this is, you know, the, the forecast uh, 40 periods out for where um, um, the model, you know, predicts the, the path of the economy will converge to steady state. Obviously, this is unrealistic. I don't think we're going to converge back to 40%. Um, I think we all agree on that. And especially not by 2024, right? And, but I think this really does highlight an issue with monet with, with, forecasting, especially in the DSG settings, that where we assume the level of debt is going to settle is extremely, extremely important, or even the level of inflation or output, right? Um, and, I, and, and I think, you know, we need to discuss that more. I'm not, I'm sure we all know, and, and most of us that do the modeling know this very well, but I haven't come across too much discussion about this. Um, so anyway, what we do as a counterfactual, we say, okay, well, let's condition on certain key variables that we're interested in and we use the actual data that i use the actual data that's come up until now for the debt to gdp ratio output growth employment and then also include the policy rate all right um and and this goes up for 20 for 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 sorry uh, it's about eight nine quarters uh now that the data or eight eight quarters or seven quarters of the data is available and then i make some assumptions about the path of the economy up for 20 quarters right they, that debt will so for example um for debt to gdp right this is the the increase in debt and then it's the kind of projections that more or less what the treasury and and others have projected you know that you'll stabilize the close to 90% by 2024. And then I let the model for the next 20 quarters kind of see what path it takes um, uh, uh, converging. And I'm, I mean, this response is massive, right? I don't think we, we can believe this, that this is a seriously um, serious contraction, but um, um, uh, in, in debt, um, but at least relatively speaking, it, it tells us something. And then on the right-hand side is this, there's the fiscal sustainability gap measure with the same kind of um, including the same uh, uh, estimation approach. 
So you've got these paths for debt, output, employment, and the policy rate. And then for each of these observable paths, you need to have a kind of an instrument that will target that. And this is where I'm thinking about, you know, trying to simulate the COVID-19 um, scenario. Okay, typically, these conditional paths are used for policy analysis that you normally see. So you would forecast conditional on monetary policy, keeping interest rates, let's say, at the zero low bound for 20 quarters or whatever. But what I did here is obviously using um, actual economic outcomes. And my assumption about the COVID-19 shock is that it's both a demand and a supply shock. Um, and that this demand side shock comes from cons um, um, household preferences. And the supply side shock comes from employment. And um, the New York Fed also models uh, uh, introduced their their two shocks in their DSG models, these two shocks in their DSG model for the COVID-19 as well. Um, so I kind of went with that. And that I think that story is, is reasonable, this demand and supply side effect. So I allow these two instruments to help match output and, and employment. And then obviously for government consumption, it'll be that instrument. And for the policy, monetary policy, it'll be their instrument. The red line excludes the policy rate, okay, as a control. And, I'm, and you're going to see why just in a moment. What's interesting, okay, just note that the red line is more out, okay, or the fiscal sustainability gap is more, is worse when we exclude the monetary authorities. And this is a counter, counter was initially counterintuitive to me, okay. So we simulate the shock, and I'm really just going to show the, the short, the, the, the monetary policy role here. Um, so what do, you, what do you see here? The blue line is showing up until about, uh, or up until the end of 2020, there is the actual policy response that's happened that you see this policy rate cut of, uh, what was it, three and, three and a half basis points up, in, up until three and a half percent annualized. So I don't know, I can't remember exactly how much, three basis points or two basis points cut in the policy rate. And then I assume that the monetary authorities keep this constant up until the end of 2024, and then I allow it to adjust. Um, and what you see here is if we do not control for the monetary policy response, right, and make some assumptions on it, you get this massive, in annualized terms, right, um, um, reduction in the policy rate that's implied by the model. Um, I didn't expect this initially, but obviously hindsight, I was like, that's obvious because the output response is so large that the monetary authority is going to respond. Um, and so this is, have, I mean, you, this is not possible, right? You, you're going far below the zero low bound here. And I thought this was interesting from a modeling perspective that it's, it's, there's no clear or obvious way, even in an emerging market where, you know, you hear the Reserve Bank say at four and a half percent inflation target and we're keeping rates at three and a half percent, you know, we, we're, we're avoiding the zero low bound scenario. Well, you know, if the shock is large enough, clearly not. And um, if, even if we hold it steady, you know, the, uh, at, at the current policy, I even run another counterfactual where they drop straight to the zero low bound and hold it there for 20 quarters, you still get this dip at the end here. I actually sliced it off. Um, I, it's a small dip here. And then you can see in the, in the long rate here um, that the monetary response, you know, that, that occurs here, you know, the, the long rate still dips. It doesn't go below zero, but you can see kind of that extra extra dip on the side. So just going back to um, um, this result, why then if you have the lower interest rate, does the, con um, the fiscal kind of sustainability response take longer, right? And is almost worse in our, in, 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 in our measure. And it's, the reason is, is because debt increases. So when monetary policy is more accommodative for longer, the response of debt accumulation by government within the model environment, that's the so debts on the right-hand side, um, is to, you know, because debt servicing costs are much lower, that means that they can transition back to steady state slower. They need not actually be, you know, fiscal austerity, you know, might not, or fiscal consolidation might not have to be as, I thought that was, that was an interesting um, um, uh, result initially. Um, and, and, and then, you know, we even see that the, re the response of output is even is actually more sluggish. So it, it, yes, it alleviates the burden on the debt stabilization side, all right? But it also leads to a slower return to the 
to the long run growth path, which is the dotted line of GDP, this, this, this kind of uh, slower convergence. So it's, I mean, it's not, then again, it's not obvious, you know, is there a middle road? And that's why I think, again, the, the Saab is doing a fantastic job and um, uh, with all this uncertainty, it seems, you know, that there are trade-offs everywhere that you need to think about. I mean, obviously I would like them to cut rates <laughs> for, for any of the data I have, but, but that's, in that, that's a personal bias. Um, no, I'm just joking, but I, I really, I, I, yeah, uh, I think these are highlighting some salient um, 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 issues that we have. Okay, I've gone for an hour. Thank you. And let me just go through these implications and, and I'll leave the modeling issue slide just up for you. So <clears throat> in the current environment, it's clear that an investment driven debt finance fiscal stimulus could reduce the government debt to beat GDP ratio, especially in periods of economic slack, right? When monetary policy um, would typically be more accommodative. Now, I did not simulate the investment response here, and I wanted to do this, and I was trying to do it just before. Unfortunately, I didn't, but I will get to that, where I want to actually simulate an investment-driven um, um, fiscal response with monetary accommodation. And, and the IMF has done something similar to this uh, recently, and it'll be interesting to see um, if, how those results compare to their global model. Policy coordination is achievable without loss of credibility or a mandate change. Um, the strong preference for policy rate smoothing by the Saab means that monetary policy is suboptimal, quote unquote, but I think the potential gains for inflation stability appear very marginal. So although the model's saying you, know, you can do more, I don't think there's, there's much more that can be done. Um, um, but these two, at least policy coordination it, it does still hold. Fiscal policy needs to balance the short run versus the long run in terms of fiscal sustainability. And I think this is really, really important for both monetary policy and fiscal policy, that the extent of their forecast errors um, and the assumed long run steady states, these are very, very important for policy decision making and credibility. Um, um, uh, yeah, we can talk about that a little bit more. And there's, I just highlight some modeling issues I have touched on and we can open it up for discussion now. Thanks for the, uh, 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes extra time that, that I could have. Oh, thank you, Hilton. This is really great. And um, I'm sure you've noticed all the questions trickling in. I uh, oh, well, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get to the questions, I would like to hand over to Dr. Romain Husse from the University of Namur in Belgium. Do you want okay. to incorporate any of the questions in yes, the discussion? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this uh, interesting paper. Uh, I enjoy uh, listening to the speaker. I think uh, this is where I think we'd like to go to really bring this uh, two policy instrument uh, in a combined analysis uh, to understand, uh, I mean, what in fact uh, each of them, but also uh, if there's a room for coordination and uh, what kind of impact I think uh, it has on the economy. And I also appreciate uh, very much uh, the counterfactual analysis uh, that you develop. Uh, I think to me is also a way to test the model. Uh, so that's the way I see the model. Certain things are not working well. I think that should push you to see where you need to fix the model. I think to, this is the part I like very much because it brings you to really try to think some about where we are going and what can the model say. I, I like this part very much because it has a direct uh, interaction with policy. Um, and uh, you also have uh, some um, quite intuitive uh, result. I think uh, the result is well known. Eh? So if you, uh, you, if you finance uh, investment uh, uh, versus consumption, it's clear. This is something very well known that uh, you increase the tax base and then indeed, uh, I mean, you are in a good, you will go to a good regime. So I think uh, it is, uh, it's giving also a sense that something is go working well in the model. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I, I, I like the paper. I, I, I will, uh, I, I didn't have time to read uh, because uh, yeah, it's quite tight. Uh, so I will just uh, um, open discussion on a number of points. Um, it is not clear to me in the analysis uh, whether you are modeling different maturities. Uh, 
and how this uh, model in the model. So this is quite crucial to, to see what you are actually doing. Uh, it's not clear to me, but you show some numbers. I think maybe something to explain. Um, yes, um, when you talk about reduced form, it is not clear to me what uh, exactly you do. You do uh, unconditional correlation. Uh, is that what you do? You do. Um, I, I, I run, I just run simple OLS regression and I do a structural VAR as well in the paper. But yeah, it's okay. not my main thing. So I kind of stopped when the results were qualitatively similar. Yeah. I yeah. need to, it was a flush, first blush and I need to get okay. back to them. So because wow. uh, what we see in that data, if you do conditional analysis and did with the VAR, what you see, you see that interest rate decrease. Uh, when government deficit increased. This is what you see. Uh, yes. So uh, last year, I, I gave a presentation on some work we are doing with uh, one of my uh, former PhD, who is now at the Banque de France doing um, a fiscal policy for France. And what we found, and then we learned then that nonlinearity is important to be able to replicate the kind of co-movement you want. You want to have, for instance, period where debt is sustainable versus the debt is not sustainable. And then we have, it's not DSG, so we have uh, um, time series techniques, but we learn quite a lot. And we okay. are able also to do fiscal monetary interaction. And this is, okay. I, uh, yeah, we, we are still uh, finalizing some writing, uh, try to update. Um, I will not show you the slide I presented last year, and it was quite interesting. We have a nice discussion with some colleagues uh, at the conference, and I also like very much this uh, network. I mean, it's been quite uh, inspiring to try to continue discussing and learn a lot from you. Um, uh, I learned that there is, some, there is a puzzle in your analysis, uh, at least for one result. It seems that when government expenditure increase, output decrease. Although you have in that model, you have hand to mouth consumer, which is puzzling to me because these, when you introduce hand to mouth consumer, uh, this helps uh, indeed uh, to have uh, a positive co movement. And, which is, and then the question is what is their share in the model? Mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, I, I think that will be possibly interesting to, 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 to have. Um, um, yeah, and then also I was even much surprised uh, for the transfer shocks. I was not expected to find that. Um, so this is a, something you will possibly answer. And then the next question is about your fiscal rules. Uh, so if I understand well, your instrument government expenditure. And then uh, uh, you... So there's six instruments uh, for government expenditure, the three components, and the tax, uh, the tax rates. Okay, okay. So uh, as you offer tax instruments. So, okay. So now I think it is uh, not clear for me from your presentation whether the coefficient on the debt is negative always. Um, so the response is uh, uh, increase in debt, yes, negative, always. Ah, because in output, your presentation it, it was not clear. So you only show the absolute value. Um, so the reaction function has, for what, <laughs> the reason, how it was included in the model, with it's with a negative okay. coefficient. It's kind of the assumption that if it's positive, then it's counter cyclical okay. Okay. and counter to okay. the debt. So when it's positive here, it's actually counter cyclical. Okay, okay, it's good to it's know. Only the yeah, it, yeah it, was not, uh, it was not clear for yeah, me. Sorry. And okay, then, uh, negative. Yeah, and then I was wondering whether you could experiment with the deficit uh, rule. Because uh, all you started from the beginning, you say, look, I want to have a deficit, uh, and then you have a stabilizing deficit. Uh, this is what also we try to do. And then you use HP filter, and then you really derive the debt, uh, the deficit uh, debt stabilizing. Huh? You can have that uh, element. And then I thought it might be interesting to uh, also experiment with the deficit rule. Uh, because the government, I think, uh, I mean, they're, of course, the true instrument are the, these two guys. But I think at the end, you may want to see what is the combined effect. And I will be 
quite interested to understand that. Um, and then I come to the model. Uh, so I think we met eh, three years ago or four years ago. Now it's been quite some years that I'm uh, coming regularly to this meeting, which I like very much. I'm a fan of your, this meeting that Nicola is organizing. I think Nicola is, uh, is doing a great job. Um, so, and uh, for, for, for doing all these things. And then I think we exchange on some paper yourself, you are doing some research on commodity. And this commodity has direct and indirect effect on real activity, on uh, 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 hours work, uh, on uh, consumption. And this obviously has an implication of fiscal uh, base, right? And then uh, uh, the impact of fiscal policy. So it seemed to me is uh, an important element to have for South Africa. If you want mm -hmm. to think about, uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah, uh, the role of policy. And uh, it seemed to me that this is a, uh, a key thing. Uh, so we exchange some time, you know, we are de developing ourselves some work there and uh, we have some material. So you, uh, we share some material. You could use this, I think, to integrate uh, this part. And I think it's very crucial. It's a key. And it might be explaining possibly why some of your counterfactual are, may not making sense because this commodity has, uh, is an important driver, is an important connection between the domestic uh, and uh, the rest of the world. And it yeah. seems to me it can uh, play an important role to, to understand the dynamics. Um, and then possibly the last comment is about your policy analysis. So what you do here, you have a loss function and you put some weight, you're playing with some weight, uh, which I think is not transparent. In a model where you already have some agents uh, that are different, if I understand well, you have two type of agent. And this agent, because they are different, uh, there is a, so the welfare are different, are affected mm -hmm. by different things. And I think you then can use the welfare to do the policy analysis instead of using the policy, uh, the welfare of the government. And in that sense, I think you can study policy trade-off between the two agents. You can study monetary policy. And then uh, uh, one of my another PhD student with whom we develop uh, uh, the material on South Africa, he is uh, at the National Bank. He has a chapter on that where he's really study different type of agent. Nicola was in the committee, uh, which I think uh, it's more fair to do the policy, I think, analysis uh, based on the uh, welfare of the society. Yeah. Uh, and this is more transparent. And then you can learn, I think, uh, uh, I think uh, interesting thing. So I think, uh, yeah, this is, um, uh, what I can um, exchange, uh, I like uh, the analysis, I like uh, the framework, I like this workshop, and I would like uh, sincerely to uh, thank uh, uh, and congratulate uh, Nicola for bringing, uh, I think, uh, this platform. Uh, and yeah, I've been uh, yeah, stressed, stressed that I will not be able to do, to come to this uh, workshop, but finally I made it so, and I learned uh, a lot also from your presentation. I would like to congratulate you again. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Thank you so much, Romain. It's really a pleasure to have you with us, and we're really glad that that you could make it. Um, as Nicola was saying earlier, it's with all our Zoom meetings these days, we can be in so many different countries in one day. But um, it's really we appreciate your feedback, and. Um, Thank you. So, you, I think Nicola. I can respond is, quickly. Yeah. Oh, would you? Okay. I can. Oh, I you can want to respond? Okay. You want to respond first, then Nicola? Let me shoot okay. A, a few out so, because there's six, but I'll just thanks, Romain, for the comments. They're, they're very useful. Let me just quickly touch on some of them. So, one uh, about the maturities, you're absolutely right. You know, uh, there's, there's, you know uh, there's no assumptions about the maturity structure. I worked on one model with Rudy Steinberg and, and Rangan and where, where it's also, you know, from work that really did before, where you you kind of modeling the entire yield curve in the DSG setup. But this, I've I, I spent a few weeks on this, and I want, the model takes one day to run, so it it is just extremely inefficient to do it that way. 
there is an, I found another paper very recently and I happen to be able to incorporate it, but there's, you know, a nice parameterization that you can use, again, reduced form to kind of proxy for maturity structure. I can't remember the exact paper, but it's by good, good researchers. I'll find that for you, but I am looking into that. I, it's, it's not, it's certainly not obvious how to do it in an efficient way because the ultimate goal is for me to develop a model for, for the, the treasury. But I, I initially wanted to include maturity structure and as well as a financial accelerator effect um, or financial frictions in some way. But again, with the model, 100 equations, it takes two hours and plus to run. It, it, it's, and, it's, and it's quite, yeah, it, it's, not, it's, 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 not, it's difficult to get it to, to run smoothly. And I'm thinking about in the back of my mind, you know, when new data comes, you know, how's the model going to cope with this? Um, thanks about the reduced form paper, uh, um, reduced form uh, um, uh, 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 question you raised. I would love to get your paper. So if you can send that to me or give me a reference, then please later, I would like to have a look at that. The rule of thumb consumers. Yes, this is a very good question. Um, the model consistently is estimates a, a, a low ratio of rule of thumbs. Let's say about 0.25. Um, whereas we know, you know, the majority of households that are hand to mouth in South Africa are much larger. And this is an aggregation effect. And I think these, the DSG models are going to struggle a lot with this. Harry Kemp and his thesis actually played around with much diff different values, fixed values for rule of thumb households. And even then, um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's not a significant... Um, but what um, do you mean by rule of thumb changing? So you fix it to 25%? No, so I estimated, when we estimate it, it just, it will converge to the more or less the same value every time. And I think this is but, an but aggregation. But which information effect. you have to estimate that? You have data? So we estimate. don't have the disaggregated data. So we, you would have the aggregate consumption data and all the aggregate macroeconomic data. And, and I think this is, this is exactly the right question to ask, because when you're thinking about distributional effects of policy, we need to, our models will you know, are not, the, the macro models are not going to capture this. It's going to just give you an average or your aggregate outcome and, and what best parameterization fits that. Um, so I definitely agree with you. There is an issue with that. It, it's just capturing aggregation effects. And I, not pro, I will propose that you fix uh, this, uh, given you don't have material. For instance, uh, if you have maybe data on um, access to finance over time, yeah, you can use that to estimate. But if you don't have data, I will propose that you just fix and change the value to see how your model is performing to make sense that so things are right. Because now there is identification issue and it's a bit more difficult. Yeah, okay, thank you. And then, and then it's for the same reason that you get this kind of transfer shocks. And again, there's, we've done lots, I've done robustness checks on this. And Harry did a lot as well during his PhD. And again, transfer shocks, kind of the same finding keeps keep coming up. Um, the deficit rule, I'll look into that. I think that this is maybe indirectly already addressed through the optimal simple rules, but I think, yes, you can explicitly provide a rule for policy, um, fiscal rule. Uh, I've just been hesitant to go there immediately because it is work for Treasury and I don't want to start saying, hey, here's a fiscal rule um, that I think you should try out. But, but I agree with you. I think that's definitely where to go. The role of commodities, of course, important. I also have a paper on this. Um, you definitely see, you know, the typical supply side effects dominating there. Um, and yes, again, the policy analysis Obviously, I was focused on the kind of target variables for monetary or policy. And so it's not a welfare analysis. Yes, it's more of an optimal policy in terms of um, um, the mandated target of, of the authorities. But yes, if you wanted to do a proper welfare analysis, you would need to incorporate the social plan and utility function. And um, then, yeah, and definitely look at the, at, the, at the weights on the different households. You would need to fix that, that transfer share of transfer, um, the transfers issue, the share of rule of thumb households. But these distributional effects are important. I'm not sure if the DSG models are the best suited to handle this yet. There is a lot of work on heterogeneous agent modeling and maybe integrating this into DSG modeling. And hopefully the SAMNET um, initiative will, will kind of help us. I know, I know some, one, some of my colleagues like Davi van Lil and, and Gideon, you know, are already working on some heterogeneous agent models. So I think, you know, we, we, all your questions are great and, and definitely we need to look into them. So thank you very much. Great.
Thank you. And um, so, Nicola, would you like to respond before we yeah, get yeah, into just, the questions? Yeah, uh, just two minutes, two minutes nice. because there is a lot of questions. It's nice, it's nice that um, yeah. you can interact directly with everybody. Because what I wanted to say is, is simply this. This is a fundamental area, I think, for the next uh, foreseeable future. This is the big question and the big risk of the South African economy. Therefore, is the, we are at the sort of at the uh, at the point of departure. Do we go the Argentina side, or do, or do we find a path back to stability? And it's true that there is not enough research, or there is not enough. You know, in the past, there hasn't been enough research. And therefore, that's why also I you know, strong arm you to present this one here as a sort of uh, uh, you know. Uh, start to to really focus the attention of everybody on uh, on uh, this issue, and then much more that that we need. And I was really thinking that you know one of the next initiative of the some of the some net, and I think as soon as possible at the beginning of next year, probably we should do one uh, workshop only on this issue, the fiscal and monetary policy, really looking at all the work that has been done. Darwin, you, you, uh, you mentioned Darwin and uh, people at Stellenbosch, there is uh, Lucille and uh, Tem Binda doing very nice uh, uh, work on, uh, on, on the maturity story. Uh, we have, there is uh, Katharina working on the uh, on the on the risk premium, uh, to me some we remain uh, doing try, try to do some micro uh, micro analysis for uh, determination of the of the fiscal shock. Therefore, there is a lot of pieces, bits and pieces around. And really, now I think it's time to to sit all together and see what is that we know, what is that we need to know better, what is that, uh, and uh, really to use the network uh, for something very specific. That is this issue of how we fit, you know, like Apollo 13, how we fit uh, around in a square, given the tools we have. Uh, and, uh, and there is a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, research, a lot of open questions. This one will be uh, what we need to do uh, going forward. And I think it is also important to, to understand that we can only deal with this with the multiple uh, tools. Uh, each tool is, uh, uh, is off optimal for one specific uh, spe specific issue. For example, you know, we, we already discussed this one together. Uh, you know, the SG model, I think, is very important, is very useful to give us the, you know, the general equilibrium effect, a really a way to think about the problem and the, all the connection. I don't think, for example, that, you know, to try to, to make it for a, as a forecasting tool actually might reduce the ability really to, to map the territory properly in attempt to do a forecast that given the uncertainties, etc. I, I think it would be, you can see, oh, once you do the forecast, what you have is that the model forces you to the anchoring at the end, uh, because the sort of is the nature of this model that, you know, they work because there is a, a fixed anchoring at the end at which the model has to come back. And therefore is, is you know, uh, is the usual uh, is the usual trade-offs that, that we need to uh, to consider. Then maybe you, we need to bring more data in, and we need to really to do a lot of other work uh, collaterally. And I think that these are as uh, as the as the as as the paper that set sort of the map uh, that we need to to explore. I think is uh, is really good, and uh, is really thank you to, for for presenting. Although I, I, you had to. <laughs> jump a bit of loops to, to do that and uh, thank you for that and in particular i think one thing uh, one thing that i have a question about is the uh, treatment of the risk premium in here okay, therefore how what is the the risk premium and how is transmitted to the economy therefore uh, you know the financial the financial part of this and also when we think about the risk premium then what what romain was saying about how we relate us with the rest of the world become extremely important. Mm -hmm. Because at the end, the risk premium, yes, we have the estimation that risk premium is positively related to level of GDP, et cetera, but big influence is also the external element. Therefore, is what the monetary, US monetary policy is, what are the shocks, the risk attitude of international investor and all the other element that really produce, therefore, what is the, the economy is becoming 
because of the increase in debt, the economy is becoming more and more sensitive to external shock. Therefore, we are more and more in risky uh, situation. That sometimes means that more capital coming to us, but the policymakers should not think that this is good. Uh, that mm -hmm. Maybe now we are able to finance a lot of this because uh, you know the interest rate in the rest of the world is very low and uh, there is so much stimulus that capital is coming to us and therefore we have a very loose budget constraint. And therefore, okay, we had uh, an increase in, in the risk premium at the beginning of the COVID, but now it's coming down. And the risk is the relaxation. Okay, it's not a, it means that the market are not signaling uh, that there is a risk. But actually, the risk is that you know another shock, and we and, and there is premium just bans. Therefore, the effect of the international financial and economic shocks in our fiscal sustainability, I think that one is there is not necessarily what this model should do because also I'm a, a bit uh, worried about trying to put a lot of stuff in the model. Mm. That after the model cannot handle. Uh, therefore, each uh, to uh, a model is very important yeah. for any model. I think to find what the core or really of the relationship that you want to analyze is. That's why I was saying, you know, the forecasting or maybe uh, is. Uh, but I, I thought one thing I wanted to ask about is how this uh, risk premium because I think is one of the thing that we need really to understand mm. better. But essentially is. Uh, it might be an invitation uh, uh, for the next chef for the next meeting. Uh, I wish we could yeah, uh, we can possibly do it in person. Eh? Okay, yeah. Romain, uh, because, uh, <laughs> to do it in person and just to bring in the table everything we do. And as I always say, everything should be open and so that we really uh, learn from each other. And you know, we 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 really have a sort of uh, also because it is a finish, because the problem that we have is a lot of international literature, because it's exploding international literature of fiscal policy, but really they are looking at a situation of zero lower bound, so it's all a different in which, you know, R is less than G, it's all a different debate. And sometimes you see this debate coming into South Africa, affecting our policy debate, and there is not necessarily a contribution, a very strong contribution from our side to, de to develop our own uh, understanding of the situation given this, and in this, for example, relationship with Latin America, with the Chile experience, etc. I think it would be also very useful for all of us. But I close this and then you have a lot of answer uh, questions. <laughs> okay. Um, right, thanks, so, thanks, Nicola. Yeah. yeah. Would you like to? Should I, I can yeah, I can address respond? some of the questions that are okay. in, that I can see in the chat, and if I I'll go I'll quickly go through them, and then if I'm missing any and you see, then you can just raise up, Margot. Okay, sure. Um, we do also minutes, there is so. also um, yeah, Andrea would also like to ask a question. So should I should maybe do that? Um, I can see Andrea's question here about debt finance fiscal stimulus. And he's in the he's beginning. And his hand yeah. is also up, so um, okay. maybe get his question and then we'll have all of them on, on the board, on the table together. Cool, so yeah, thanks Andrea, you can ask your... Thanks, thanks Margot, um, just confirming you can hear me? Yes. Great, uh, thanks Hilton, um, really, really interesting and, and I can't kind of emphasize enough how important this is becoming, this interaction between fiscal and monetary policy and this... Um, this this topic really in, in financial markets um, so i'm really pleased that you presented this today um, as you see in the chat I, I just like to kind of get my mind around debt finance fiscal stimulus um, you know how does that differ from any other type of fiscal stimulus if you're running a budget deficit i mean isn't all fiscal stimulus debt financed if you're running a deficit so maybe some ideas of how that differs from any other scenario. Um, and in the second one, um, uh, what was I going to ask? Oh, yes. Um, I feel a little bit embarrassed asking this question. It might be in, in, in light of the, uh, the detailed quant work you've done. It's, it's a relatively simple one. Um, but, you know, policymakers and the public like to anchor on a number or a target, right? On one simple and easy to communicate idea or target, um, which 
In the case of inflation targeting, it's four and a half percent, right? Pretty simple, straightforward. Um, in the case of debt sustainability, this is, it starts becoming quite fuzzy because, you know, it's, it's, we can have, we can throw various academic and technical definitions at debt sustainability, but in practice, uh, it's, it's not so straightforward. And so from your work, is there a line in the sand for any variable, whether it is a primary balance or a debt to GDP ratio? Is there a line in the sand that you would say, right, anything beyond this variable or beyond this, beyond this number or ratio is where we've crossed over the, the, the Rubicon, right? We are in, 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 in debt crisis territory. Like, is there a, a number for South Africa that you can think of, given your work, that we can draw that line at? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, I hope. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm glad. I'm 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 a lowly academic, and my weight will not be that what I say will be so influential to change any financial market variables. You know, as I'm speaking, you start seeing the the, the stock market jumping around. No, um, thanks, Andrea. It's nice to hear from you again. Um, just in terms of DFFS, so really what I'm trying to highlight here, you, you are absolutely correct, right? So is not all expenditure debt finance that there's a deficit. And what we're really trying to do with the modeling is try to isolate um, the specific expenditures or tax cuts that also lead to debt, um, uh, uh, an increase in debt, and then looking at that increase in debt and how it affects interest rates. Because again, in a kind of a traditional setup, that, that a higher level of, of debt supply by, um, by treasury um, um, will actually uh, attenuate demand side stimulus. So we kind of, you want to see in terms of the cyclical component, there's also a long run component that actually debt accumulation by, monetary, uh, by fiscal authorities can actually crowd out the stock of capital and lead to a low marginal, um, uh, I mean, a higher marginal product of capital and a higher level of uh, real interest rate. So that's the kind of long run literature that focuses on that. Looking at the cyclical side, you're just trying to isolate the effect of a government spending or tax cuts that lead to an increase in debt. And then you want to see how that rise in debt is kind of affecting the three transmission mechanisms that I pointed, or the two others besides the, the crowding out. And then even in, even in um, increase in debt, it, it will have an effect on the portfolio balancing of households. So the, 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 there'll be another that mechanism through there directly too. Um, so in a practical sense, yes, this is the great question. Um, it's, it, it, this, this is where the micro comes in. And I think it's really important, especially if we're thinking about the current economic environment, you know, uh, build, building, let's say, you know, someone at the treasury pointed out, you know, it's interesting that, you know, RDP housing is not seen as an investment, but a transfer. And just as an example, whether it's incorrect or not, you know, RDP type housing development was probably not something that's going to be very efficient or something that stimulates, that does not stimulate it, um, um, large scale employment will not be a good investment um, approach. So right, construction typically crowds in, in, in employment. Um, the, uh, the IMF, obviously, you know, they have, they, they discuss this quite a bit, but they tend to be very much on the green, green agenda, which is perfectly fine. I think South Africa should, you know, not miss out again on another revolution since these, 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 these you know, um, inflation information technology that we've just kept on missing um you know um, um capital mobility etc historically as well um so i think that you know I, the way i see government i see government as facilitating the market economy that's my personal view in other words they need to provide the structure the infrastructure hard and soft you know, the roads, the railways, et cetera, and that needs to be efficient. They can do, you know, maintenance that, 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 that's backlogged and et cetera, build, you know, more efficient, you know, greener public transport or whatever. Um, but then there's also the soft side, right? So it's also the infrastructure on the soft side. It's the, you know, information technology and, and other things like that, um, telecommunications or whatever. So facilitating the infrastructure and the economy that allows the market economy to be more efficient. This might be, you know, your traditional pub, public goods as well that that um, 
<clears throat> like the market just is too, too much uh, uh, of a fixed cost, initial fixed cost for markets to get in, that the then fiscal policy has a role, or just other public goods that, you know, markets just won't provide. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, to, to be very specific about something, that's what will require a lot of work with the micro data, with the guys at Treasury. You know, there are many um, the Sustainability Institute guys are also talking about this a lot, and they're thinking about, you know, green finance and incorporating roles of, of fiscal policies there. Um, so I think, yes, we need to be very imaginative, creative, proactive, but um, I definitely, it, if we're going to think about a role for fiscal policy, it needs to be the obvious ones like corruption and efficiencies. And then we can think about, you know, the spending on, on an investment side. And I think that's what, right, that's what the Treasury is trying to do. They're trying to cut back on consumption expenditure, the wage bill, and they're trying to, you know, prioritize investment. So let me quickly just... Um, I've seen through Estian's questions here. He's got a couple of questions. And, and also uh, uh, on the output gap, you're sorry, absolutely. Can I? Sorry yes. to interrupt. Um, Estian also has his hand up. So should we maybe okay. allow him to chat? Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, <laughs> cool. Thank you. So then, just there might be more more questions, or they may have changed. So thanks, Estian. You're please go ahead and ask your questions. And yeah, over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, just two remarks, apart from the questions, if the time runs out, I can always uh, chat with uh, Hilton on the questions uh, at, an, at another time. Nice coffee. <laughs> Some coffee again, that'll be great. Just, just two points. On fiscal rules, I am very skeptical about the usefulness of fiscal rules because everywhere they have been uh, set aside when crises uh, turned up. In fact, I came to think that fiscal rules only help in normal times. Anyway, uh, for me, for me, fiscal rules may be useful, but they neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition for uh, fiscal sustainability. For me, the real uh, thing boils down to the nexus between the president and the finance minister of a country, which are very much on a personal nature. So uh, but that's my view. And I know uh, people are very fond of the idea of fiscal rules and fiscal councils. But even then, it only works if there is, but I would also like to call it an umbilical cord, which cannot be severed by party political uh, contentions. Uh, so that's the one thing I wanted to say. This, the other point is about optimality. My sense is that if one for a moment thinks back to the Tinbergen uh, rules or assignments of, of policies, uh, coordination need not mean that both policies need to deal or tackle the same objective or even have to work uh, in the same direction. Uh, sometimes there can be conflicts in the policy goals and fiscal policy is more appropriate in dealing with one and monetary policy with the other. Their optimization doesn't mean maximization of both, but precisely where, what the word optimization means, and that is you maximize one thing under constraints of some other consideration. So I just wanted to mention those two things, which may be of relevance for Hilton also to consider in the modeling approach. Thank you. Thanks, Estian. Thanks very much for those useful comments. I can quickly answer other, the Estian's other ones about the output gap that's in the chat. I don't know if everyone else can see that though. Can everyone else see that, Margot? Um, I think, At least on my screen, yeah, they can I think, see. I think people can, but um, we may as well just ask okay. it in case people are, are struggling. Okay, so, so yeah. Okay. yeah what, so Essien <laughs> asked about the potential output in the modeling, and, and um, this is a great question. Typically, I would include potential output, so the flexible price kind of version of the model, and then you kind of model the output, uh, potential output, the flex price equilibrium, and then that will give you an output gap. 
this is a very large model, 100 plus equations. I'm still working on the flex price equilibrium. So eventually you would include in it basically an entire another model. So you, we have to still, it won't change, I don't think too much, but that's if everything works out nicely, the, the general results that are here. But it is important, yes, in terms of the policy um, uh, uh, um, narrative that typically we're, we're stabilizing deviations of output from potential. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's a great question. Reverse causality is included in the model, obviously, as a general equilibrium. So, and, but, but you raise a very good point here, and this, this, this dead spiral. So this is also, again, in a nice Voxy U article that just came out now recently. They talk about you know, getting into the risk spiral where even with low interest rates, like with South Africa, relatively low interest rates, and we actually see, if I can quickly go maybe here, you can actually see this in the risk premium measure. Um, here, you see the risk premium rising substantially, even though interest rates are fairly flat. And so if government is accumulating more and more debt, um, um, you can get into the scenario where, the, where, you're, where, where you're in a kind of like a debt spiraling with higher interest rates and higher debt. Um, and that's, that's, that's very interesting. And that is in, kind, of, kind of mechanism is included. For well, the third question, um, <clears throat> um, allow the model the impact of debt on interest rates via the exchange rate. Again, a great question. This is not done in this model. The reason being because most of the debt is domestic dominated. Um, but yes, if we are, again, every, every model change or like addition to the model is not a one for one increase with the difficulty. It's, it's exponential. So make a small change, it becomes a lot more difficult. But yes, there is, you definitely would want to split the two. I'm also working on some other results to kind of try and identify credit rating shocks. Um, and then obviously there, there's a foreign and domestic component and a short run, long run maturity component. Um, and, and this is, this, it depends, like what Nicola said earlier, you know, the DSG model, uh, it cannot do everything. It needs to be very specific. And if we're going to ask more and more questions, we need to go to a semi-structural model or something else, a very large scale semi-structural model. But you're absolutely right. And I think that they, they, I mean, there is a role for debt, um, for the, the net foreign asset accumulation and the exchange rate in the model, but it's all implied by the model dynamics. So it's about the foreign, the foreign debt. So households do have access to foreign debt, um, but it's not the government's foreign debt. But there is a role of the exchange rate here. So in general equilibrium, there will be some effects. Um, contingent liabilities, no. Again, this is a great question. And um, we are, I'm looking at this with other work with um, Charles Uister and Harry. We want to look at some of these kind of these contingent liabilities and also the role of government in, in, in the energy sector. Um, but yes, it's a great question. It, it, it's definitely relevant and it needs to be considered and thought. And hopefully I will, with my engagement with National Treasury more and more as I understand the kind of the real plumbing of fiscal policy and also chatting more, having more coffees with you, STM is always nice. Um, I will get a better understanding of how best to model these things. Um, Monique pointing out a, another great question about the fiscal policy and its role uh, in financial stability. And this was again, the Saab just mentioned this um, yesterday that you know, the South African banking sector is indeed resilient to shocks, but the biggest you know, um, um, point of uh, uh, potential uh, risk is the sovereign debt. And I think, you know, um, we need to, um, to, to really uh, think carefully about this. Um, um, and let me just see what the last bit. Okay. But there's some other interesting stuff I can always chat to Monique, but it's also really something interesting. You know, not, I don't think the model would capture all the risk because it's in the banking sector. Um, the ECB actually just released another um, uh, uh, article or finding, um, I haven't looked at it in detail, also just in the last few days, where they're kind of admitting this kind of very, there is indeed a link between sovereign debt risk and the banking sector. So in other words, if you think about South Africa, high quality liquid assets are sovereign debt. What happens when government is changing the maturity of this debt that's outstanding? How does this affect the liquidity in the banking sector? What happens if, you know, the debt's downgraded or there is in fact a default? I think, you know, debt management policy, which is something else I'm getting more and more interested in. And also because a lot more people are asking about, you know, the debt management policy. Um, 
of, uh, of government. And this is actually often, it's often distinct from uh, fiscal policy as in our, what you see here. So this is the maturity structure and how financing is done. Um, and, I, and I think that's also very, very, very relevant. Great, thank you very much, Hilton. Um, are there any more comments from anyone in the panel from all those questions? Let's go to lunch. <laughs> Great, yeah, we're a little bit over time. After we but... will, uh, as I said, the appointment and beginning of next year, we organize another one. Actually, you should organize it. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you can okay, do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll help you. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Okay, oh. thank you very, okay. very much. I really I enjoyed again. it a thank lot. You. Thanks, Margo. Oh, thank you. Great. Thanks also, Romain. And um, we'll see you at two o'clock for the second session this afternoon. Have a good lunch and enjoy a good cup of coffee.